is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Soteriology 101. I want to answer a quick question about uh, a video that just recently was released from John MacArthur, who was asked the question, is the Arminian view a heresy? Um, And he just to be frank, gets some facts very wrong. I, I think he's just misinformed. He's usually a very careful scholar um, and a great pastor, but he just must be informed. I don't believe he's intentionally lying to this young man or anything like that. I, I think he's just misinformed, and I want to correct some errors for those who may be interested. By the way, if you want a good seminary education, you might want to consider Trinity Sim. Uh, edu. It's Trinity Seminary. It's where I'm an adjunct professor, and we actually um, check our facts before we say things out loud like this, um, because we uh, ultimately what MacArthur's doing here is misaligning not only um, Jacobus Arminius, but Arminians in general. And even we as traditionalists, we're not per se Arminians, but we don't want to misalign or misinform uh, people about what Arminian, uh, Arminius or Arminians actually believe and teach, as MacArthur does here. So let's correct some errors here and just better understand our, our points of contention and the facts of the matter. I, I've been uh, repeating that uh, old saying of facts don't care about your feelings. That's true theologically as well. As much as you may love John MacArthur and you may agree with uh, so much of what he says, uh, that doesn't change the facts of the matter. You may disagree with me theologically. You may not like my personality. That That's separate from the facts of the matter. Um, and facts don't care about your feelings. They're just factual. And so we want to actually observe the facts of the matter with regard to this question. My first question is, if Arminian theology deals directly with salvation and how it comes about, and if it is false, why is it not seen as heresy? Uh, just to clarify for you, he said Arminian, not Armenian. <laughs> there is a yes. very big difference. There are there are, all good Armenians are Calvinists. No no Arminian is a Calvinist. Big difference. And, and that is a, a pretty tell sign by the way whenever you're on Facebook or posting somewhere and you say um, something about Ar- Armenian and not instead of Armenian with the i um then it shows that you're not you haven't really been educated very fur, further into the the doctrinal system and and that's what's interesting about this is that he's kind of critiquing people for being uneducated but yet he's sounds like from what he's about to say very uneducated with regard to Jacobus Arminius's actual teaching and that's um, again not like MacArthur he's usually a little bit more careful of a scholar than this um, Arminius was a theologian, an ancient theologian, who believed that salvation was in the hands of the sinner and not God. In other words, he believed the opposite of, uh, of what we affirm as biblical theology that was basically refined down to what we call Calvinism. Okay, this is the conflation of the Calvinists that we've talked about quite often, where the Calvinist conflates God's choice to forgive the sinner with the sinner's choice to ask for forgiveness, okay? Those are two separate choices. Again, facts don't care about feelings. That's just the fact of the matter. There are two choices involved here. And if you conflate them and treat them as one and call them salvation, then when he says God is sovereign over salvation, or God is control over salvation, what he means is God is as much in control over his choice to save sinners who ask for forgiveness as he is over whether the sinner will actually ask for forgiveness or not. Do you see the difference? It's like to use the prodigal son story. You can say that the the father is completely in control over what he does to the son when he comes home. But it's a whole nother thing to say that the father is also in control of whether the son comes home or not. Um, and that's what Calvinists have done. They've conflated those two choices, which again, it's just a fact of the matter that there are two separate choices there. Now you can, you can argue that both of those choices are in control by the father if you want to, but you can't pretend by using the logical fallacy of conflation of that, that those are the same exact choice by saying God is in control of quote unquote salvation, meaning God's in control not only of the fact that he's going to save this, this and restore this son to his 
um, full um, heir status by giving him a golden ring and killing the, the fatted calf. That's all of the father's choice. He doesn't have to do that. He deserves punishment upon his return. But the Calvinist says God is not only in control of what he does to that son, he's also in control of whether that son comes home or not, that he's ultimately controlling that choice of of, of the child to to ask for forgiveness, to uh, to humble himself, um, and to to seek that forgiveness. Again, conflation of the Calvinists is just a logical fallacy. They they easily can back people into a corner because they feel like, well, I can't deny that God is sovereign over salvation, or that salvation's in the hands of God. I, I don't want to say no to that. And so they just concede to the Calvinists because they don't recognize the logical fallacy of conflation. And, and we just simply point out, yeah, God is, of course, the salvation's in the hands of God. Of course it is. Um, just as the, the restoring of the father um, in the prodigal son story was totally and completely up to the father. We just don't conflate man's choice to repent with, with God's choice to save the repentant. Uh, we believe salvation is all of God, the sovereignty of God. Arminius taught that salvation is by the will of man, that man has within him the ability to believe on his own. There is enough, he would say, there is enough grace, there is a kind of prevenient... Okay. Again, what are the facts? Um, we can actually read what Jacob Sarmenius says because we have his works. There's a thing called Google um, now that you can <laughs> find these things on. Um, and so let's just hear what Jacob Sarmenius actually says. He says this, this is my opinion concerning the free will of man. In his primitive condition, as he came out of the hands of his creator, man was endowed with such a portion of knowledge, holiness, and power as enabled him to understand, esteem, consider, will, and to perform the true good according to the commandment delivered to him. Yet none of these acts could he do except through the assistance of divine grace. Now, did you hear that? None of these acts could he do except through the assistance of divine grace. But in his lapsed and sinful state, man is not capable of and by himself either to think, to will, or to do that which is good, but is of nece necessary for him to be regenerated and renewed in his intellect and affections or will and in all his powers by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit, that he may be qualified rightly to understand, esteem, consider, will, perform whatever is truly good. When he is made by the partaker of regeneration or uh, renovation, I consider that since he is delivered from sin, he is capable of thinking, willing, and doing that which is good, but yet not without the continued aid of divine grace. Now, does that sound like a person who believes and taught that God, that man can do things all by himself or on his own? Not, not even a, a, a traditionalist who denies the concept of total inability believes that. We can't, we can't believe, how, how can they believe on one whom they've not heard? How can they believe and come to uh, believe in Christ if they've not heard of him? That's the divine inability we believe in, that God has to reveal these truths. And Jacob, Arminius, was even more Calvinistic, if you will, on this point than traditionalists are. And yet, uh, MacArthur seems to completely misalign him. Now, he goes on to explain very, you know, uh, surface level of this concept of prevenient grace, which y y you guys know, if you've listened to this broadcast for any length of time, that we believe is a redundant term. Um, we believe the gospel is God's work of prevenient grace, revelation. God brings the light of revelation, and, and therefore the Holy Spirit works through means, the means of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. It doesn't say regeneration is the power of God into salvation. It doesn't say uh, a prevenient working of some separate, you know, supernatural work of grace is the work, uh, the power of God into salvation. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. The gospel, which is what is speaking the truth, when when Paul asks that that question, how will they believe in one whom they've not heard? That implies that if they hear, they may believe. Um, these things were written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name, as John 20, 31 says. And so there's no reason to suggest that if, if one hears the plainly revealed, inspired truth of the Holy Spirit that they can't believe it. Those who can't hear it would be those who have grown calloused to the revelation of God like the Israelites of the first century would have been. They had grown calloused, otherwise they would have seen, heard, uh, understood, and they may have repented, as um, uh, as we read in Acts 28, verse 27 and 28, which he goes on to say, therefore I take the message to the Gentiles, because they will listen. What's the distinction? They're both sinful, they're both fallen short, 
The difference between the Jew and the Gentile is that the Jew has grown calloused and hardened and is now being cut off in his unbelief. He has been given over to his rebellion so as to bring the Gentiles in. That's what's happening in the first century. And therefore, there's, I think, a lot of misunderstanding of what the intentions of the New Testament authors are with regard to the nature of man from birth, from both Arminians and Calvinists. Nevertheless, we still see very clearly here MacArthur is completely misrepresenting what Jacob Arminius actually taught with regard to um, the fallenness of man and his incapacities without the divine aid of the Holy Spirit and the work of God to to bring light and to bring revelation to him. Um, and so, uh, again, he goes on to uh, con- continue to malign um, uh, Jacobus Arminius is something that he was not. In grace, a kind of available grace, even in the fallen sinner, there's enough there for him to muster up faith on his own. It's not a work. Faith, muster up faith on his own? Is that what Jacobus Arminius said? Or did he say he needed his divine aid all along the way? Okay. M- mustering up faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. So is that on your own? So if you have the the powerful Holy Spirit-wrought truth being proclaimed to you clearly, are you, quote-unquote, on your own anymore? No. (laughs) You're being confronted by the Word of God, the double-edged sword that cuts through both bone and marrow, soul and spirit. That's the divine-inspired Word of God, that, that Word that brought life into existence. Are you saying the Word of God is not sufficient to enable someone who is lost to respond willingly to his call to be reconciled from that lost fallenness? That, that's ultimately what the Calvinist is saying. It's not just about the nature of man here. It's also about the nature of God's Word. How powerful is God's Word in your worldview? I believe that God's Word is sufficient to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And according to 2 Corinthians 5.20, it is sent to make an appeal, that Christ in us is making an appeal to be reconciled to God through faith in Christ. Therefore, we can't have faith on our own. We must have divine revelation brought to us by the Holy Spirit, which he is sufficiently doing by the Scriptures, by the inspiration of holy apostles. He's bringing the truth so that we may know it. That is God's quote-unquote prevenient grace. I just don't need to call it prevenient grace. I'd call it gospel, power of the gospel. The gospel is sufficient to do what God sent it to do, to bring light and revelation. work of God, it's a work of man. Uh, You probably have heard the word Arminian, but maybe didn't know about Arminius. But you do know, perhaps, about Charles Finney, uh, perhaps the most notable early American evangelist. Finney was a full-blown Arminian, or as we would say, a Pelagian, because Pelagius taught the same thing. Wow. Um, Arminius is rolling over in his grave. Okay. <laughs> and, and Brian Abishano just died a little bit inside somewhere in the world. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so factually incorrect, brothers and sisters. What is, again, I have an article on my, uh, my blog site called the, the Boogeyman of Calvinism, Calvinism's favorite boogeyman. And when I say boogeyman, that's a fallacy, a logical fallacy, um, in which you try to associate uh, people with a bad character. And Pelagius, whether he actually taught it or not, we're not exactly sure. Many of his writings, which had to do with this particular subject, were deemed heresy and burned by some councils in the, in, back in the day. So it's difficult for us to know exactly what he taught. But um, even we have records of what he did teach, and from what he, we do know about him, he never taught um, what he's maligned and accused of teaching. Um, however, I don't want to be one who's <laughs> finding myself having to defend uh, Pelagius because uh, because it, he's a known boogeyman. It'd be like trying to defend Hitler or somebody like that within the theological world. Pelagius has been uh, so maligned and so beaten up over the years and um, misquoted and not quoted at all um, that w- we have no clue as to what he really taught or what Pelagianism really is uh, within the theological uh, debates back and forth. But Regardless, go read that article if you want to hear some actual historical quotes and facts on the on the issue of Pelagianism. But the the Pelagianism proper of what has come to be understood or known as is is this concept of man being born completely innocent without the fall and and all of those kinds of things and that they, that he just like Adam was completely innocent and that's you just heard what, what I read from Jacobus Arminius himself is he a Pelagian you know no now you maybe somebody could say well he meant semi Pelagian well that's not what he said he called him a full blown Pelagian um, and even if he were to call him a semi Pelagian if you actually go back and listen to the Council of Orange and the places where um, the whole Pelagianism controversy were uh, w- was discussed, 
Um, they actually denounce Calvinism, too, in that council, by the way. Um, and they also promote the baptismal regeneration of infants. So it, that's when you use the term Pelagian, you're actually appealing to a council that held to things that we as Baptists and uh, as men like MacArthur would completely denounce as heretical and false theology and false beliefs. And yet you're appealing to ultimately those councils as your authority when you use terms like Pelagianism as a label dismiss boogeyman tactic instead of actually dealing with rational, biblical, sound facts of the matter. Finney believed that people had the power within them to come to God, to come to Christ, to believe and be saved, to turn from sin on their own, that it was purely an act of the human will and God was not responsible for what they did or didn't do. Once again, let's just look at the facts. Here's a, from the Internet, again, the works of Charles Finney. Uh, he writes this, several passages of Scripture ascribe conversion to men and that this is consistent with other passages which ascribe conversion to God. So I want you to notice the balance that Finney's trying to argue here. He's trying to argue that there's passages which seem to ascribe the conversion of man to men, and there's other passages which, which seem to ascribe it to God. So he's not being imbalanced here. He's not saying it's all of man and all by himself and all those kinds of words that MacArthur is kind of painting. If any, he's trying to show balance here, that there's passages which can, you know, that ascribe conversion to men. There's other passages which ascribe conversion to God. He says, I also purpose to discuss several further particulars which are deemed important in regard to the preaching of the gospel and which show that great practical wisdom is necessary to win souls to Christ. The Bible ascribes conversion to men. This is his first point. His second one's going to be the Bible also ascribes conversion to God. So he's going to balance the two. So listen fully to his teaching. There are many passages which represent the conversion of sinner as the work of men. In Daniel 12.3, it is said, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Here the work is ascribed to men. So also in 1 Corinthians 4.15, quote, Though, the, the, uh, though thee have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Here the apostle explicitly tells the Corinthians that he made them Christians. He begotten them uh, with the gospel or truth which he preached. Again, in James 5, 19 and 20, we are taught the same thing. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him and convert him, let him know he which converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save the soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, I might quote, Finney goes on to say, many other passages equally explicit, but these are sufficient abundantly to establish the fact that the Bible does actually ascribe sometimes the conversion to men. Point two, the Bible ascribes conversion to God. Here, let me remark that to my mind, it often appears very strange that men should ever suppose there was an, in, uh, an inconsistency here, or that they should ever have overlooked the plain common sense of the matter. How easy it is to see that there is a sense in which God converts them, and in another sense in which man converts them. The scriptures ascribe conversion to four different agencies, to men, to God, to the truth, and to the sinner himself. The passages which ascribe it to the truth are the largest class. That men should ever have overlooked this distinction and should have regarded conversion as a work performed exclusively by God is surprising. So it is that any difficulty should ever have been felt on the subject or that people should ever have professed themselves unable to reconcile these several classes of passages. The Bible speaks on this subject precisely as we speak on common subjects. There is a man who has been very ill. How natural it is for him to say of his physician, that man saved my life. Does he mean to say that the physician saved his life without reference to God? Certainly not, unless he is an infidel. God made the physician, and he made the medicine too. And it never can be shown but that the agency of God is just as truly concerned in making the medicine take effect to save life as it is in making the truth to take effect to save a soul. To affirm the contrary is downright atheism. It is true, then, that the physician saved him, saved him, and it is also true that God saved him. 
it is equally true that the medicine saved his life and also that he saved his own life by taking the medicine. For the medicine would, would have done no good if he had not taken it. In the conversion of a sinner, it is true that God gives the truth efficiency to turn the sinner to God. He is an active, voluntary, powerful agent in changing the mind. But the one who brings the truth to the sinner's notice is also an agent. We are apt to speak of ministers and other men as only instruments in converting sinners. This is not exactly correct. Man is something more than an instrument. Truth is the mere unconscious instrument, but man is more. He is a voluntary responsible agent in the business. Does that say, sound like an irrational man who thinks it's all about just the man and God doesn't help in the process and all these kinds of things? Listen to how MacArthur goes on to malign Charles Finney. And I, again, I'm not trying to stand in defense of, of Pelagius uh, and everything he taught or, or Charles Finney and everything he taught and believed or, or Jacobus Arminius. You know I've, I've contended with Jacobus Arminius on many points. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just facts are facts. And there's no reason in order to prop up your particular brand of theology to malign and mischaracterize another's. And that's exactly what MacArthur goes on to do here. And so he developed a manipulative kind of evangelism that basically attempted to, to prod the sinner emotionally to manipulate the mind and feelings of the sinner to get the sinner what he, to do what he believed the sinner could do and should do. What one person calls prodding, another person could call persuasion. Acts 28, 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to a place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning until evening, explaining about the kingdom of God from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them, almost like he's trying to prod them or something, like he's, he's really striving. He's begging these people. He's trying to persuade them about Jesus. How long? Well, he just did a five-minute invitation um, and played just as I am. No? Oh, no, no. He did? What? How long did he do this? From morning until evening? Oh, come on, Paul. Don't you believe in the work of the power of the Holy Spirit to convert? The, just tell them plainly, get it over with, and then move on. Stop manipulating people with the gospel, Paul. Trying to persuade them about Jesus all day long? Come on. That's, manip that's prodding. That's manipulation, Paul. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Would not believe. That's an act of the will, by the way. Some were convinced by what? By the inward work of the Holy Spirit that supernatural and irresistibly changed their heart to make them be convinced. Not what it says. They were convinced by what? What he said. What he said. Oh, so we conclude, therefore, that it has nothing to do with God or what the Holy Spirit does. No, any more so than the physician that Charles Finney talks about. Yeah, you say, that, that, that physician saved my life, but we also acknowledge God saved my life, that medicine saved my life, but we also notice God used that medicine to save my life, but I had to take the medicine. All of those things are involved in Charles Finney's gospel. In John MacArthur's gospel, one thing's involved, God. God and God alone. No, nobody, nobody else is involved. We don't want to give any credit to anybody else. Heaven forbid we give any credit to anybody else being involved in any of these things. It's God and God alone. And anybody who says anything otherwise is a heretic or teaching false doctrines and just is way out there, weird, Pelagian, boogeyman guy that we just can't listen to and talk to. Again, we don't have to malign brothers who disagree with us and misquote them or not even quote them at all, misalign them by, by holding to our, the truths that we hold to. That even the scriptures, the word persuasion is used three times more often than the word predestination. And yet Calvinists emphasize the concept of predestination a thousand times more than the concept of, uh, of, of persuasion. How much more should we be emphasizing the need to persuade the lost, to bring apologetic methodology, to show them, to beg them, to plead with them, to call them to repentance and to faith, to use persuasion? If it takes all day for us to use the law and the gospel to show them through the, the scriptures, through evidence, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that they 
should know and should believe in this truth. That's what we've been called to, as 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about, that because we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade men, that there's a persuasion, a need to persuade, because the gospel calls us to that. Paul was actively persuading not only the Jews, but going to the Athenians, referencing their, their unknown God and calling them to believe and to talk about this unknown God. Again, MacArthur goes on to malign, I think, um, otherwise, decent brothers, they weren't perfect. They had false teachings and false beliefs that they didn't understand completely, or we didn't, wouldn't agree with everything that they said. But there's no reason to, to um, completely misalign or uh, just factually, incorrectly, say that these guys believe something that they actually did not believe. This was Finneyism. Dum, dum, and of course, dum. out of Finney, fin- Finneyism, another label we can put on those Arminians, those, those people who actually believe that, that people might have something to do with reconciliation, the bringing together of two parties. It's what reconciliation means, by the way, the bringing together of two parties. Okay? H- heaven forbid that we actually think that reconciliation has something to do with the will of man being reconciled to God and his appeal to be reconciled through forgiveness. In his error came all kinds of cults, all kinds of cults. In fact, most of the American cults came out of the the burned-out area in New York where Finney functioned for so long. Now, and this is the same kind of thing you hear from um, some of the other Calvinists who talk about how liberalism Natural, natural, liberalism naturally grows out of Arminianism. It's just what's going to happen. If you, if you fall into Arminianism, if you uh, adopt Arminianism, then you're just going to become liberal. Hello, look at the Presbyterians. <laughs> okay, okay. So same kind of thing. You, you can try to boogeyman. Again, it's, a, it's a trying to put a particular doctrine with a particular group of people and say, look at what happened to those people. And, and we could do the same thing to them. In fact, facts of the matter, um, it was a predominantly Calvinistic and Presbyterian um, clergyman who defended um, slavery, um, chattel slavery in the 1800s. The, the Southern Baptist Convention was started by people who held to uh, slavery, and they also were more Calvinistic in their doctrines. Does that mean that Calvinism must be wrong because many Calvinists were slave owners and, and actually defended slavery? No, it, there, there are separate things. You could say that the doctrine itself lended for the support of slavery because you do believe there's different classes of people that God has predestined or created, and that's what some of the Calvinists actually use. You've got Charles Whitfield, um, um, who is, who's defending chattel slavery, and John Wesley, who is the Arminian, of course, um, defending uh, abolitionism um, and trying to stop slavery, um, and they were doing so. Many times their arguments were based upon their sociological worldview of God's predestined or, you know, the quality of man as Wesley would hold to. Um, again, you can malign groups with all kinds of st- subjects like that. You can you can put those people in the categories, but you're not being uh, factual and honest by totally, completely separating the person's doctrinal p- perspectives and things that could have gone into the ditch on one side or another from either perspective. Both sides can, can throw those kinds of stones at the other side without looking at the scriptural arguments. Let's go to the Bible. Let's look at the, what the Bible actually says about these issues. And instead of maligning people or misquoting people or not quoting people, he doesn't even provide any quotes here. Of course, I know it's a question answer time. It's off the cuff. Um, and, and maybe he would be more studious if it was something he was writing about. I haven't seen any evidence of that, though. Is it possible to believe that you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have the power to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and go ahead and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sin and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior and do it genuinely from the heart and not know that that was actually a work of God? It is. It is possible. Uh, You wouldn't think it was utterly unaided because even a person who's not sure where the power comes from or how much power and responsibility they might have on their own, even that kind of person knows you have to hear the gospel and would assume that God has... It's just the gospel, though. That's not enough. That's just... It's just a little gospel. It's just a little... You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be facetious, but you think about that. 
that's ultimately what the Calvinist has to do. They have to relegate the gospel as just, uh, it's just information, as Sean Cole has said when in debating with me. That's kind of what the Calvinist has to do. It's just information. It's just, just info. No, it's the power of God unto salvation. It's a life-giving truth. It's inspired by God himself. It's the words of God inspired and given to holy chosen apostles. It is the double-edged sword. You cannot relegate, quote-unquote, the gospel to just, eh, it's information. That's all. It's just that. No, no big deal. What? When the gospel is being proclaimed, when the gospel is being read, the Holy Spirit is working because the gospel is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. He brought the gospel. He inspired it. Therefore, it's the power of God unto salvation. Therefore, anyone who believes the truth of the gospel is believing the truth brought to them by the Holy Spirit. No one is, is working all by themselves, unaided by God. You cannot say that, not given what God has done by sending his son. I had somebody on Twitter um, just recently. Matter of fact, look at this. It's a tweet from uh, Michael White, who's a Calvinist. That gets, he's a Presbyterian Calvinist that gone back and forth with me several times. And he says, it seems you're saying that man has to take the first step. And I write back as say, incorrect. I'm saying man is responsible to reply to God's first step. God, in his incarnation, has stepped into the world. He has stepped into our lives to reveal himself clearly. The gospel is inspired, sent to chosen individuals from Israel. The purpose for electing Israel, the purpose for electing Israel was to bring the good news to all men so that all nations of the earth may be blessed. The original promise in Genesis 12, 3 that he gave to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through your seed. That is the purpose for God electing Israel and certain individuals from Israel to bring the promise to the world, namely Paul, namely Peter, namely the other apostles, given this word. He has taken the step. He has come to seek and save the lost. And therefore, what we are saying as quote-unquote Calvinists, non-Calvinists, as quote-unquote Arminians, as quote-unquote traditionalists, whatever label you want to slap on those who don't agree with the tulip systematic, what we're saying is not, no, we're taking the first step to God. No, we're the ones who initiate this. No, it's not what any of us have said. What we're saying is that we are responsible, able to respond to God's step, to what God has done. Yeah, somebody can argue, hey, you, 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 you can't call the president and you can't get him on the phone. I would say, absolutely, you can't. Can't get him on the phone. But does that mean I can't answer the phone if he calls me? Because that's ultimately the way Calvinists interpret Romans chapter 3, for example, that no one seeks after God. Okay. So does that mean that we can't respond to a God who seeks after us? Because that's what you seem to imply by your statements and your arguments. We are responsible as fallen people. We are fallen, okay? But does that mean we're not responsible to God's call? His appeal, Christ's words, the words by which we will be judged according to John 12, 48, that we can't respond to his call to be reconciled from that fallenness because that's what the total inability of Calvinism teaches is that mankind is born morally incapacitated, morally unable to desire, to want to be reconciled, even in light of the law and the gospel, even in light of the powerful Holy Spirit-inspired truth of God calling us to reconciliation, that is not enough, that is not sufficient to grant us the ability to respond willingly to his call. That is nowhere found in the pages of Scripture from anywhere I can see. And again, John MacArthur, as well as many other Calvinists, have not properly represented the other side, even the Arminian side. I have yet to find, and I'm still challenging, besides Sean Cole, besides Sean Cole, who's you know, good brother, but he's not a notable uh, scholar, even by his own estimation, any more so than I would be. Um, I have yet to find a notable Calvinistic scholar who is actually engaged with the claims of the scholars from our perspective. You, you'll hear a lot of painting of these broad brushes, never providing quotes, these, these surface level kind of things but very rarely do you find scholarly Calvinists who are actually willing to engage with our scholars. Where are you? And why aren't you willing to engage with the scholars at any depth and any level? To go beyond the pat answers, to go beyond the surface level conversations. They're not a lot willing to do that. Not a lot willing to represent us rightly in order to actually deal with the claims that we hold to. Uh, to actually go through the biblical arguments of what we hold to. So that's my challenge. Got like, kind of thrown down there. 
Um, find me some notable biblical scholars from the Calvinistic worldview who are actually willing to engage with the Jacobus Arminiuses and the actual scholars of the world in an in a de- in-depth way, not at a surface level way or a, a way that misaligns or completely factually um, misstates exactly what they actually believe and teach in their own writings. Um, that's the gala. So for more information about this, um, I encourage you to go so- to Sociology101.com. There's the website here. Um, if you just type in Sociology101.com, you can uh, support us. We'd love to have your support. This is the way we're going to get the word out, is if you become a patron or a one-time a giver, you just click on that support link. It's really easy to sign up. You can give through PayPal, or you can sign up as one of our patrons um, and, uh, and th- some other things that you're able to con- connect with me on um, and uh, some other information you can find there on the support link. Love to also have you in one of our classes at Trinity. Um, come and be a part of Trinity uh, Edu, Trinity Seminary. Um, where I teach several courses along with uh, Dr. Braxton Hunter, uh, the president there of Trinity Seminary, or uh, Dr. Jonathan Pritchett, who you've heard here on the broadcast before, uh, come and be a part of that. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this has been helpful. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.